Hey out there, survivors, how are you all doing? And welcome back to Let's Survive uh, Interviews. Today, as you can see, I'm here in the living room for a bit of a change up. I just needed to get out of that cold shade for a while. And uh, yeah, I, I'm so excited because the warmth of the sitting room matches the warmth that I feel for the guests that I have on the show today. Uh, guys, I want to welcome a friend of mine, a colleague, a person that I've grown to know very well over the last couple of years. Um, and that is Jonathan Barkhan, formerly of Dread Central, uh, a horror collective variety of things. Um, just an amazing human being as well. That's the important thing. And a joy, you will not, uh, you will be hard pressed to meet a horror nerd like Jonathan, who knows the type, like the, this, this dude knows he's friggin' horror, knows he's friggin' horror. I, I, I try. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just, I do that feeling of being the dumbest person in the room. That's what I feel like when I'm around people like you. I'm like, I thought I knew about horror. And then people bring up like these 1970s, like little pieces that I'm like, I have no idea what that is. I've never heard of it in my life. <laughs> I mean, let, let's be honest. There's, there have to be, at this point, there have to be like hundreds of thousands of horror movies. So it's impossible to watch them all. <laughs> yeah. So it's, like, I never begrudge anyone if they're like, I haven't seen this. I'm like, then you have such an amazing opportunity exactly. in front of you. Yeah. I, I was I was listening to a podcast earlier and somebody mentioned that it was, I think it might have been screen drafts. And somebody said, have you ever seen Dead of Night from 1974? And they were like, no. And it was like, you get to go home and watch Dead of Night. I'm so jealous of you. <laughs> <laughs> there was, um, there. so there's a, uh, I'm I'm in a part uh, I'm I'm a part gosh I can I can speak I promise <laughs> I'm a part of a weekly Zoom chat uh with a bunch of colleagues and peers and friends that uh we we made this when the quarantine started when the pandemic was announced and we all started quarantining because we just needed to communicate with, yeah. with some friends uh so it's a bunch of horror and film journalists and one of them, uh, Lee Monson, they were talking about how uh, they recently ordered a Scream t-shirt and in their drunken stupor also ordered all four Scream films. And it turns <laughs> out that their partner has never seen any of the Scream films. Oh. And we're all in this chat like, this is the most amazing thing. We need <laughs> to know how this goes. Because it's like, wow, you get to see like truly great culturally relevant and big horror titles that all of us have seen and know in and out but exactly. you can see it with fresh eyes and how exciting of an opportunity is that like how many times have you and i said to each other i wish i could forget that movie or that oh, yeah. game or that book so i could do it again i i i'm forever saying that and i mean the big one one of the big ones that i keep thinking of that with there's there's many but one that I've been thinking about it a lot with is Red Dead Redemption 2. I keep thinking, like, I just want to get the fucking thing from Men in Black, wipe my mind, and play Red Dead Redemption 2 again without knowing. Although it's really funny, because the first time I played Red Dead Redemption 2, I didn't get into it right away. I was kind of like, uh, it's slow. It's, I'm not really connecting. I prefer John. I prefer John Marston, you know, right out the gate. And then, like... It took a while. I think we, we went, actually, we can get to this, but we went and shot the parish, got you over and everything for that. So that's, we can talk about that in a bit. But um, it was after the parish, I went, okay, I'm going to reward myself now. So I'm going to play Red Dead Redemption 2. I'm just going to take like two months off and do nothing but play Red Dead Redemption 2. And I, yeah, became one of my like, god tier level video game experiences that's that's one that i have to get into because i have not played either the first or the second one <gasps> so uh but from everything i've seen it is it's one of those games where i would either get sucked into it way too much or or like you say i would start and i'd be like it's a bit slow i'll eventually get to it and then when i do i'm like i should have done this years ago. <laughs> I always say that I always sleep on stuff and then I come back to it. And I, I, I don't know if that makes it, I don't know. I think part of it is because, yeah, there's so much hype around certain things. Like, look, right, a great example of this is Cyberpunk, which just came out. There was so much hype around that game and I knew it could never live up to the hype. I knew it. Like, I was like, this game is going to be a victim because I've seen it happen time after time in the video game world that games get hyped up massively they're in development for eight or 10 years. 
and then they just don't live up. Doesn't mean they're bad games. Doesn't mean they're not good, not great, not really enjoyable. But like the problem is, it'll never. Whereas I know six months from now, when I eventually play Cyberpunk, it'll probably be a much better game at that point, and I'll probably be like, yeah. "Oh, this is really good." Like that's that's <laughs> what I've been doing. I I really wanted to play Cyberpunk, and I kept putting off getting a pre order, and then it came out to just the the most horrible of articles and and stories and i was like fuck i uh, i don't know can i swear oh absolutely i'm irish we all Good. we do is all fucking right. swear <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, i was like fuck you know I, i'm so glad i didn't pre-order it but this is terrible like this game was so hyped for so yeah. long and then they kept putting it off and putting it off and everyone in the beginning like the first time they delayed it they were like you guys make it's great fine. games. It's We're fine. totally yeah. fine with it. Then they deleted a second time, and people were like, "You make great games." I'm a little, I'm a little upset, but like, we can work with this. And then they did it a third time, and people were like, "Just release the fucking game." <laughs> and that's when I knew there was going to be a problem. And then all yeah. of the glitches came about, and all of the issues. And then they announced that the PS5 version is going to be released in, I want to say, like March or Fe something uh, like yeah, that. Yeah, February, April. I think. Um, yeah, I so it's gonna, well, it was it's meant to be, be February, so it probably it probably got delayed again. <laughs> it, it, it'll be yeah, it, it'll be February of 2027. Uh, but 2077. Uh, yeah, but that's what I'm waiting for because I'm like by then you'll have had yeah. months to patch things up, to figure out where there are issues, to clean it up a little bit, and hopefully make it a just a, a more user-friendly experience because that's the whole point when we're gaming we are interacting with the world yeah. that these people have built and that's everything that they've done it's the menus it's the map it's the inventory system it's the world itself like like even something as simple um like a great example of this i'm playing destiny 2 a lot lately oh, with yeah. my friends and the guardians have this thing where when they jump if you don't jump at the exact right angle, sometimes when you try to jump forward, it'll push you back or like it'll knock you a little bit off. And those jumps drive me fucking insane. <laughs> and they still haven't figured out how to work with those yeah. because their physics is so is so wonky in that. But like those are the kinds of things that gamers are are interacting with every moment. Oh yeah, exactly. And so if the if the experience isn't consistently at least good, then you're kind of fucked. Well, yeah, because it's not like great. Uh, this is a great way to talk about the comparison, like as in games v movies, right? The thing is, we we love horror and we love all genres, but like yep. with horror in particular, there is this whole subset of so bad it's good movies, where it's like your know movie is absolute fucking dog shit, but it is amazing. Like I can't count the amount of those conversations I've had like yeah we both been on strong language of violent scenes which is the whole podcast effectively dedicated to that to sing the praises of movies that are kind of rubbish um, yeah. games don't have that luxury because if it's not no. fun to play like yeah you can have a shit story and and whatever but a gameplay needs to be good um because the second that starts to fail the one game that I can think of that breaks that mold is deadly premonition. That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. I was just about to say that. Yeah, that is literally the only example I can think of. But I think it's because deadly premonition feels like you're playing a movie. It feels and like so you're playing you, a, yeah, Twin Peaks on steroids. Man. Yeah, <laughs> and th therefore you'll give it that that luxury. You'll give it that kind of graciousness to say, "Hey, you know, you're clearly really flawed." <laughs> But you're so charming that I'll accept you. Yeah, exactly. Flaws and all. But there are other games where they simply, where it won't, that's not allowed. And I think it's because at the very core of it, you ha they're two completely different experiences. With a film, it's passive. You sit yeah. there and you watch. You might get emotionally invested, and hopefully you do. Um, but you're not sitting here you know, making actual decisions for characters in the films, unless it's some kind of a gimmick thing, like in Final Destination, yeah. where you can choose how they die, or, you know, Black Mirror, Bandersnatch, which yes. is a choose your adventure. But it's, um, unless it's something like that, and those are very, 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 very rare, mm -hmm. then you are passive. You are just watching and accepting that you are going to have no say in how things turn out. Whereas I a video game, 
you are active. You are the participant. You are the player. You are the one who governs decisions, even though that's really an illusion because there's a finite amount of options that you can yeah, make. Yeah, exactly. There's, you know, it's, there's a story that needs to be told. And therefore, they're going to tell that story, whether you do it, you know, this way to get to this point or you do it this way, yeah. but you still get to the same point. So, you know, I think that's why you can't really have a so bad it's good video game because I, people won't accept it being bad. I totally agree. And it's funny, though, because like, like, yeah, like you, you take an Uncharted or, uh, you know, an Uncharted or a t not even Tomb Raider, maybe the old Tomb Raiders, Tomb Raider 1, 2, 3. If you take one of them, they have a story to tell and it goes like you say, it goes from here to here like it's there's levels they're, they're not that different from a mario game or a like because yeah. effectively it's the same format but then you go to a fallout and it's fucking all over the place because you forget at times there's a story you're like oh yeah what the fuck was i meant to be doing i have a clue i'm just why am i yeah. why am i why am i suddenly wearing pink underwear wandering around the wasteland like i don't know what i was doing i got drunk in new vegas and this happened <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry. That's not normal to walk around the wasteland in pink underwear. I look. We got to do what the we best do armor. To get by. We got to do. We got to do the to best get armor. By. Never looks the best. <laughs> but yeah, it's so funny because I've been recently playing like the the Spider Man games. I got, I got Spider Man remastered Miles Morales, and I again like in those games. There's often times where I literally go, Oh yeah, what? What the fuck was I doing? Like, because yeah. I just ended up going off swing right because the gameplay is so good that you forget that you're following a narrative. But then <laughs> at the same time, like that's what makes those games so great is that when you do go back to the story, you can still finish it. It's not a yeah. problem. And even like let's take Fallout 3 as an example in this discussion of like you can go this way, you can go this way, you can, you know, bounce all around. Like in Fallout 3, you could be, what was it, like good? Uh, or neutral, evil, evil good, yeah. neutral, evil. Yeah, that basically. Thing. But at the end of the day, it didn't really matter which one you were because the final story still happened. Yeah, yeah. your dad might be disappointed in you for being a piece of shit, or he's really proud of you <laughs> for being a great stand up guy in the wasteland, but you still did the, the task that you were set out yeah. to do. So, you know, people can sit here and try and say, oh, I choose how things go. No, you don't. You have the illusion oh, yeah. of choice. But you also, but the illusion of choice is so exciting because it's, you really get to show who you are in a constrained environment. Big time. And I mean, I, I often say this about games is that with movies, um, as you said, we're passive, but with movies, you, a good movie, like, I'm just going to take an example that's well known for pulling on people's heartstrings or one or two, The Green Mile or Sophie's Choice. Those are films that are going to get you emotionally invested and you are going to get like, you know, pulled into what's happening to the characters. But the thing about a game like The Last of Us Part Two is the example that I've jumped to is that that game puts you in the shoes of the characters and whether you like it or not, what they're choosing to do, you have to commit to the right. Like, because... Okay, you don't. You can just power it off and turn it off and pretend it never happened. But like, if you want yep. to see the journey through, and like you say, going into it, you think I'm gonna, I'll, I'll do it this way, or I'll. But it's like there's a narrative to be told here, and you're gonna yeah, learn whatever you learn. <laughs> it's, um, you know, I just recently played again through Sniper Elite Four, the one that takes place all throughout Italy, yeah. because um, I just love shooting Nazis. So um, awesome. But there are Shoot there are all Nazis. There are challenges in that game where you like go through the map and complete the objectives without killing anyone except for like the the goal people that you have to kill or whatever. Hmm. And I'm sitting here like, I could do that, or I'm gonna do what I always do, which is kill literally every single Nazi on this map because that's what I should do. Yeah, exactly. Look, that's totally fair. It's funny because then on the flip side of that, every Metal Gear game that I've ever played, like more or less, me and my friend Niall, we started this thing with Metal Gear where we would always do the try to do as close as possible the no-kill run. Like we would always try our very best. Now, what's great about the no-kill run is you're doing the no-kill run and, and you're you're trying your best to not kill anyone and, and stuff. 
and then you get angry. And when you get angry, you massacre. <laughs> you go on a spree. <laughs> and, like, because you spent like 20 minutes trying to get through, or 40 minutes trying to get through this part, and you just keep getting caught by the same guard, then you eventually just flip out and plug That's, away. You know, what makes that so exciting and so fun is that with a game like Metal Gear, you know, you start off and you're in a very small area, but as you progress further in the game, the area that you can go through starts to widen and grow. Yeah. And so it goes from like, oh, I was in, you know, this, you know, sewer system to I was in the sewer system that went to a lab that went to the outside that went to the warehouses, yeah. that went to the docks and all these things. And you're like, I feel like killing people. And I have all of that entire <laughs> place that I can go back and slaughter everyone. So instead of just like, I'm going to kill three or four people, you're like, I'm going to kill three or four hundred people. <laughs> there was a thing in Metal Gear Solid 3 that was awesome where it was a punishment. If you were went on a killing spree in Metal Gear Solid 3, like there was the character, there was a character, the Sorrow, and he pulled you through a river where all the souls of everyone that you killed in the game walked towards you, but you had to walk really slowly through it. So it was a pun. It was Kojima, who is a total pacifist, doesn't believe in violence, doesn't believe in. It's, he's, all of his games are anti nuclear war, like. Um, but like Kojima, it's basically Kojima being like, you shouldn't kill all those people. Now you have to suffer through 14 minutes of walking through all their dead fucking souls. And me, <laughs> I'd be sitting here going, I think I threw you off a bridge and it was fucking hilarious. <laughs> yeah, especially if they're Nazis. If they're Nazis, kill yeah. all Nazis. Um, oh God, <laughs> I, I need to tell you, I just need to gloat about this because this was one of the greatest video game moments I've had in recent years. Ariel, my wife, was sitting right next to me when this happened. She's, you know, playing the Switch and not really paying attention. But then uh, when I got this kill, she was watching and even she was like, this is the most amazing thing. Okay, so it's a level in Sniper Elite 4 and uh, I can't remember what the name of the level was, but anyone who's played that game, it's one of the levels that takes place during night. Um, and there is a, uh, when you start off, if you go to the left, there is an island across a bridge. There is a boat that goes through like canals and, um, and the main, one of the main optional objectives is there's a sniper that is picking off the resistance and you have to kill the sniper. So the first time I played through, I, what happened was I got really close to the sniper's nest and then I snuck into the building and I disarmed the booby traps that he laid and I got behind him and I stealth killed him and it was awesome. But it was like very, you know, face to face. Yeah. This time when I was playing it, uh, I managed to find a spot where I could use unsuppressed rounds. So you, it was like really fucking loud, but I was so far from everyone that no one was hearing me shoot this obscenely loud rifle. Which Did you hey, enemy at the gates him? Did you enemy at the gates this guy? Hang on. <laughs> no. Uh, but the thing is that where I was positioned, I was almost 600 meters away from where the sniper was. And I just happened to casually look through my binoculars and see the glint of his scope. And I was like, okay, let me mark him and let me see if I can do anything. Like, I'm just curious. Fuck it. Why not? <laughs> and I hold my breath and the reticle starts out big. And then as the more you hold your breath, it shrinks and shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. Cause you like get more and more steady. Yeah. And I aimed it and I waited and it got to the smallest it could get. And I fired and it did that thing where it follows the slow the motion goes, bullet time. It goes into x-ray through the scope, through his eye from 600 meters away. Uh, Patty, I am proud of the erection I got. Look, I'm proud of the erection you got as well. I know I wasn't that there was to witness it, but... I'm telling you, Ariel, I turned, I turned to Ariel and she was watching the screen. She just, this is what how it looked from her perspective. It was just, I was like, oh God, it was gaming moment, top five gaming moments of my life. Oh my God. See, I love, again, talking about games, like that is an experience that like you, if you watch that scene in a movie, you can go, oh shit, that was badass. But you didn't do it. You didn't I, make that shot. I like, felt like Barry Pepper in Saving Private Ryan when yeah. he got that shot. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm fucking Barry Pepper. <laughs> I'm not fucking him, but I'm fucking Barry Pepper. 
I, I thought you were, yeah, I, I thought you were building up to a big Jude Law fucking enemy at the gates moment, all right? Like the two the sniper off. <laughs> oh, man, I'm telling you that if I did feel like enemy at the gates a few times throughout there, just like how I was running around and like yeah. evading and everything. But no, that moment, that was Saving Private Ryan at its best. I feel like you've inspired me because I've, I've never really been massive into the Sniper League games, but like I have them all. This is typical of me. I, I own like all of them. I just never really got around to playing them. But like now hearing this story, I'm like, man, I want to do that. I want to get that feeling. I want to get that erection. <laughs> oh, and the best thing is that the x-ray mode, it also works when you shoot them in the balls. Yes, that's all we, that's ever, all I need. Ever want to see a testicle explode? Sniper Elite. <laughs> Oh, oh my God. So actually, this is a great way to segue though into like, so obviously the last, we talked about this a little bit off, off camera and everything, but like the last year really at this point, which is yeah. crazy, has been insane. And we've all been kind of locked inside and everything. It's been, it's been a tough time for everybody, but a lot of people have been using gaming or, or been losing themselves in gaming to deal with everything and yeah. so like what are some of your lockdown games what are some of the games that have kind of gotten you through uh, sniper elite i think we can probably assume sniper elite yeah. yeah um sniper elite is a big one um also and this is probably a bit of uh self-flagellation and self-punishment but um i was i played through the last of us 2 like almost as soon as as it came out because i it was pre-ordered and it was shipped to my home here in Michigan, but I was still in Ottawa with Ariel for mm. like a long period because of the, um, because of the pandemic. Yeah. And so my neighbor actually was keeping an eye out for it, got it and then mailed it to me. Oh I was my like, God, amazing. Game. And while that was going on, I also ended up getting, um, the, the last of us part two. Oh, wow. Controller. Um, so it was like, I, I just went all out for it. Nice. I just did, I just did my own custom vinyls because I couldn't get the controllers, but I was like, and I have a custom uh, Last of Us PS4 uh, oh, over there. Beautiful. Because uh, like you, that game to me just affected me in a way that I didn't think media. Yeah. Could. Yeah. Ariel, <laughs> so that's the thing, like, um, because Ariel knew about The Last of Us, but she never really played it and she never got into it. And I was like, I need you to just be in the room while I'm playing it. Like you don't have to pay attention to the the gameplay parts where you're sneaking around and killing people. But when it comes to the story, I think you're gonna get really into it. And so I, I started playing it and at first she was like, okay, this is like, it's not what I was expecting and it's really good and really interesting. And then the more I went along, the more she got really invested and in emotionally so. And when the game ended, we had this, we had a long talk about was, was Joel's decision regarding what to tell Ellie right or not. And we had, and it was a really interesting conversation because we were coming at it from a perspective of not living through the fungal apocalypse, but at the same time, like trying to empathize with those characters and and it, it created this, it was a really fascinating discussion. And then The Last of Us 2 came out and she would not let me play it, at least the story elements, unless she was in the room. She didn't, again, she didn't care about the actual like looking around. She actually got really frustrated with me because I'm the type of person that goes into every nook and cranny. Oh, that's me. For, for that's me too. And yeah. ammo and items. And that's yeah. how I would find like like <laughs> new weapons and the, the shoulder <laughs> holster and all that stuff. Like I was yeah. doing all of that. All the scrap. Um, <laughs> everything. Everything that I could do. And she was like, can you just fucking play the game? Like, <laughs> go. That's where you need to go. Go there. And I was like, no. but there's like a whole building. I have a house. And, and then have, I, I presume you also do that thing where like you do your scan of the area and then you go into a house and you're like, oh, no, wait, this was the first house I came into. Like you, you've forgotten by the time you go around that you're like, oh, yeah. Ah, I go this place is empty. I go in and I'm like, oh man, I don't remember this. It's because that's how I left. And I'm going in, I'm going in through a different side. So it's this, the same place. I'm just seeing it from a totally different angle. But um, so yeah, we went through all of that, and and God, the discussions we had about empathy oh, and yeah. vengeance versus justice versus revenge, um, 
and trauma and just everything. It was, it was such a powerful experience. And, and then also the fact that Dina was, you know, early on in the game, when we met, when we first met Dina, I was like, she's Jewish. Mm. That's a Jewish character. And Ariel was like, really? I don't think so. I, I don't think she's Jewish. She doesn't look Jewish to me. And I was like, oh no, she looks super fucking Jewish to me, which was, I mean, we're for everyone who's watching and is getting offended, <laughs> we're, Ariel and I are both Jewish. So, so I'm coming at this from a representation matters perspective, not a, oh, Jews. Um, no. Uh, so we were sitting there like, this is really, this is really. Yeah, amazing. it's great to have this character who's not really a stereotype. And then we had the synagogue scene no. and yeah. both yeah. Ariel and I were sitting there like, are you kidding? Yeah. Like, because no one really thinks about religion in video games, um, nope. at least not in the traditional sense. Uh, usually if it's like, if when it's I Devil May Cry, really, you're fighting angels or like, yeah, whatever. Like, or, like, yeah. or like the binding, the binding of Isaac uses the parable of the binding of yes. Isaac as the foundation, but it's nothing like the binding of Isaac. No, parable. exactly. It's nothing like what happens in the Bible or um, like even Castlevania. Like that's one that mm. I think of where it's like the church going after uh, vampires, but not really because we don't care much about the politics of the church. And it's just, we'll use a cross and, and you know, laurels and, you know, all those things. But it like never played such a, big role but to have and so as a result the religion and the ethnicity of characters is often something that we don't think about it's yeah. it, it doesn't really matter no one is sitting there going is samus aran christian or muslim or jewish yeah we don't know exactly she's, she's samus aran and she's fucking up metroids that's that's all that matters <laughs> um exactly no you know no one is out there looking at fuck i don't know <laughs> Sure. Like Link. Uh, <laughs> at Link, exactly. No one is looking at Link and thinking, you know, which god does he worship? And yeah. we just blindly, not only do we blindly <laughs> accept that he lives in a world where there are fairies that created their universe and their spirits and sages and everything like that, but we're, yeah. we actually kind of like it. Um, exactly, but I yeah. It's... I can't really remember Jewish characters or openly Jewish characters. Like, for example, or... I, know, I know that B.J. Blaskowitz from the... Wolfenstein yes. games. Yeah. He's Jewish. But it's never it's uh, never yeah. But even and then the the other side of that is then the like if you play any of the GTAs, especially the older ones, three Vice City, San Andreas, again you fall into the Jewish stereotype characters that like and um, your lawyer in Vice City, it's it's the very stereotypical like it's that real like you're like, oh gee, cringy, like bad TV, fucking awful, stereotypical Jewish character. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, as you say, there, it felt like there was, there was, those were the spectrums. It was like a character you didn't even know was Jewish because it never gets brought up as, or mentioned. It might be like a, a tiny bit in the manual or something, maybe back in the, like, in the day. But then like, I'm, and then the flip side of it is just like a total stereotype and joke and piss take of yeah, that and, characters. And, you know, in a game... You know, in a game like GTA, where all the characters are caricatures, you know, then th at that point, I'm like, I don't care. Because it's, it's everyone, like everyone some characters going, yeah. It's like, yeah. You know, I'm not offended by that. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not someone who is very easily offended or yeah. uh, gets gets upset by things. It, I wasn't upset by the lack of Jewish representation when I realized that Dina was Jewish. I was touched and yeah. felt seen and felt appreciative. And I think there's a very big difference there. Um, Definitely. Because I, I didn't I didn't sit there and look at that and go, I demand more Jews in video games, like overt Jewish characters. No, what I hope is that we will get more well-written and meaningful characters like Dina, where careful yeah. thought was put into it. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I, at the same time, I can sit here and go, yeah, BJ Blaskowitz, is Jewish and that's fucking awesome yeah. that the guy who is the focus or the main focus of the Wolfenstein franchise is a Jewish man fucking slaughtering Nazis. I yep. love that. And then based off of that, what I love is that Doom guy from the Doom series, he's a descendant of BJ Blaskowitz. So technically yeah. Doom guy is Jewish and he's killing demons throughout yeah everywhere and uh, he's also facing off heaven but we'll we'll avoid that one um <laughs> but you know those are the things that i can sit there and go 
That's fucking awesome. But again, it was never overt. It was never yeah. something that actually mattered. Um, and that's why I think The Last of Us 2 was so important. Oh, yeah. For as painful and as heartbreaking as it was, it was also very affirming. And it was definitely yeah so beautifully crafted and so just stunningly put together. So that one was a really big one for me throughout the pandemic. Obviously, The Binding of Isaac is great for like, you know... I just want to, I want to beat something in 30 to 45 minutes. I can do that. <laughs> man, although, I'm, although I've never beaten so it. much. <laughs> oh man, I am, I, I have so two nice. save files that are just like completely done. Oh, and I have another wow. save file that is, that is like uh, on the way, but I purposefully deleted it off my PlayStation 5 because I was getting to the point where I was like, I'm just going through the motions playing this. <laughs> But there is there is a DLC coming out at the end of March. Is this uh, uh, Repentance? No. There we go. Yeah, Repentance. Yeah, because they already did Afterbirth and then they did yeah. Afterbirth Plus. So now it's Repentance, and I was like, you know what? I'm not going to play any Binding of Isaac until Repentance comes out because I want to feel like it's somewhat fresh and yeah. exciting and new. So yeah, I'm really really looking forward to that one. We uh, but that was another pandemic game and now like i said lately i've been doing a lot of destiny 2 um simply Cyber because a lot, of, a lot of my friends play it and so it's a great way to in this covid world that we live in to communicate yeah. with my friends and to you know hang out with them yeah you know we used to do it in person we would have land parties and or like everyone would bring over us you know uh, yeah. our playstation and my friend had a couple extra tvs so we would plug into like shitty old like 720p hd the biggest best at the time <laughs> kind of thing when it's like this big um and we would just all play destiny together and it was amazing um and th so this is a way of kind of recapturing that but apart from that um what did i play? It's, I played a lot of i played a lot of horror games um excellent i was gonna actually i was gonna talk to yeah. you on horror because like yeah we're both horror fanatics and i mean uh, I would love, I'm curious, like, do you remember what, like, your first, like, the, the horror game that you first played that, like, had, like, a big impact on you? And, I know and it. I know it very well. Uh, because I still love this game, and I actually bought the soundtrack on 7-inch vinyl through, I want to say Mondo released it. Uh, oh, nice. It was, it was uh, Castlevania 2, Simon's Quest. <gasps> oh my God, that game, that game drove me crazy as a kid because oh, I didn't oh, yeah, it's, it's fucking awful. <laughs> that's, that's one of those games where people I think are justified in saying it's bad, but I'm going to sit here and say, yes, it's bad because of shitty translations. But if yes, the translations yeah, were exactly. actually done right, then it would be so much more clear and HD, understandable. A HD, like hand-painted remake of Simon's Quest with like proper translations so that you do know that you have to go and stand by that thing and use the fucking item so that you get whirlwinded away to the next place because that drove me fucking crazy for so long. <laughs> I want to say that that within the past few years there was there were some people that made a re not remaster but they yeah. sort of redid Simon's Quest so that it had better translations. It had actually much more nice. informative translations. Yeah. And also all of the text boxes would fast scroll rather than be like, But what like, was the thing that gets said constantly that I fucking, like whenever it would turn to night, what was the thing? Like, oh, even, um, what a what a horrible night to have a curse. A curse, yeah. <clears throat> and like that, game, that game in 19, I don't know, 80, Seven eighty-eight. I don't know. I'm, sta I'm taking a stab in the dark there. Yeah. Could even be earlier. I don't know. But that had a day to night cycle. Like nothing at that time had a day to night cycle. Like it had a day to night cycle. It had effectively a kind of an, an open, open world. world. Yeah, yeah, an open world experience. It had towns with different uh, citizens that had their own stories. It w had semi RPG elements where you could like upgrade weapons and you had to get the right weapons for the right boss. It had items. It was it was doing a lot of really crazy and ambitious things. Not all of it worked, and a lot of it was done in very poor ways where, like, you would go into one of the uh, the manors to find the pieces of Dracula, and the floor, like, all of it was the same texture, but some of them were actually invisible, and you're saying, yes. like, could you have given, like, 
like even three pixels of difference. <laughs> yeah. So I could have something to let me know. But not no, just like, memory, not just remembering that that one is invisible, that one is invisible. Like that's the yeah, only way. Uh, you know, you're that's what slowed the game down is you would yeah. walk like you'd walk on a block and then throw the holy water to see <laughs> if it would go through. No, okay, walk the next block, throw the holy water, walk the next block, throw the holy water. Oh, it fell in. Let me go to the very edge of this block where like if this is my if th these are my toes and this is my heel, like that is what I'm standing on. And here's my front foot. Like the back of my back heel is all that's needed to support me on this block. And I'll throw a holy water, it landed, I have to jump. Yeah. <laughs> Again, ambitious things, not all of it worked. Some of it really did. And the soundtrack oh, is yeah. pure mint. I, I just think all, personally for me anyway, I think all of the Castlevania soundtracks, more or less, they all are beautiful. Like, uh, my, I I was never a gigantic Simon Quest fan, but that mainly came from the fact that I didn't own a NES. So whenever I would go to, like, my mate's house, I would play his. So I played Zelda, I played Zelda 2, I played Simon's Quest, I played... But I, I didn't own them. But the first Castlevania that I owned was Super Castlevania 4 on the SNES, yep. which I really enjoyed. Now, that was a much more traditional, like, the first game just like more of a platformer action game than like, but the funny thing is my favorite Castlevania game, which it's not going to be a shocker because I think maybe 80 to 90% of the Castlevania fan the nice. base. Yeah. Like, yeah. and that, when you play that and then you think of Simon Quest, you're like, holy shit, 10 years before Symphony of the Night came out, they were trying to do elements of what they would do in Symphony of the Night. As you say, the RPG, the open world, like the whole idea of a Metroidvania that people say started with Symphony of the Night really began at Simon's Quest. Like it was it was Metroid and Simon's Quest. Yeah. The combination of those two games are the genesis of the Metroidvania genre. It's yeah. just a lot of people don't want to recognize that. It's kind of like how people talk about how Blair Witch Project is like was like the the ultimate in like the origination of uh found footage found footage and and people are like well what about cannibal holocaust yeah exactly like, just because you haven't heard of it or you don't you don't think of it as being as good or as relevant doesn't mean that it isn't as important and yeah. so a lot of people look down look down their noses at simon's quest and again i'll fully admit rightfully yeah. so in some cases but i think the importance of simon's quest is vastly under I, undersea it's funny because i didn't really i mean until we had this chat i would never have even really put that together like i never really dawned on me until we had this conversation right now that i was like wait a minute my favorite guess of any game is simply the night and that literally is everything we're talking about here which is open world rpg elements and um, the only th difference with simply the night is it had stunning at the time well no it's still gorgeous graphics because they're hand painted and rendered stunning um but like on top of that it's had the luxury of okay not an incredible localization but a better localization than Simon's Quest would have gotten I mean and it I also still had the, the it dialogue also had the benefit of, um, dialogue of, in, of memory space exactly yeah like and I mean I remember do you remember those rooms you'd run through in uh Symphony of the Night that you would know it's loading because it would just be a silent room that you just run yep. through <laughs> but like again Symphony of the Night amazing soundtrack like so good. Um, and then I just, on every stream at some point, I'll end up saying, die, monster. You don't belong in this world. Just yeah. on every stream, <laughs> I will say that at some point. <laughs> what is man? A miserable pile of secrets. <laughs> but enough talk. Oh, man, I used to know it. Uh, me and my mate now, that and the ending of Soul Reaver, we used to know the two monologues, like, off by her, or, or duologues, off by her. Yeah. Um, but it's funny, something you talked about a minute ago that I just want to jump back to as well is you yeah. talked about how the pandemic and, and like playing games brought you together with people that you'd normally be in the same room as. And it just made me realize how much I'm actually missing couch co-op at the moment. I don't think I'd really stop to think about how much I've missed couch co-op. And like me and one of my best mates, we've been friends since we were like three years old. And like we played all the Gears of War games in co-op. We played all the Halo games in co-op. And we yep. could, in theory, both get our Xboxes, connect them online and play Gears 5. But for me, it just wouldn't. My brain is like, no, you can't do that. No, that is like not the right. Thing is, you know, they just announced back, excuse me, uh, back for blood. Oh yeah, which I, the left I the team. yeah, and I'm sitting here like I'm like I cannot wait to play this game, but it it makes me remember 
how my friends and I would do LAN parties for the yeah. first Left 4 Dead 2 games. Like we would bring TVs and bring our Xbox 360s. We would connect them all together and we would just like order a bunch of pizzas and get a, you know, a couple cases of beers and just stay up till like three, four, five in the morning playing through runs. And those kinds of experiences are quickly becoming fewer and yeah. farther between um, because now with, I mean, even with how TVs are set up, you, you stop and think like how, how our old TVs were, they were squares. So it was very yeah. easy to make, you know, four quadrants if you wanted to do golden eye, you know, yeah. together something like that. But now all the TVs are in widescreen. So how are you going it, to, it's, it's not going to be as, it's not going to look as good. It's not going to work Art. as well. It's a, you've got a curved and a lot of, TV. And a lot of them don't even do it. <laughs> yeah. A lot of them don't even create that kind of a system. They've, the couch co-op is quickly becoming a thing of the past. Yeah. And it's heartbreaking and it's understandable. Mm -hmm. it, it just, it, it is what it is. It totally is. Like, and I mean, it's why I do cherish those, those things that do still give you that experience. Like a great example is your, and you, you mentioned it a while ago. I think you were talking about Ariel playing it, but like during lockdown, one of my favorite experiences was setting up a little island on Animal Crossing with my family, with my two daughters and my wife. And we would play together. We would play separately. We would sometimes play on the system. We'd sometimes we have two switches, so we would sometimes play on separate systems. But like we were just for the first couple of three, four months of lockdown, we were just kind of like building this little island together. And I'd like be up till four o'clock in the morning working on stuff. So I'd have the switch with me while I was rendering out a video and I'd be doing something. And then in the next morning, they'd we'd all play it on the TV and they'd be like, oh, you built that? That's awesome. And it was like, I was like, this is to me, like the, these are the experiences I really love. Like the, the fact that yeah. you can, they can be individual, but then you can get that shared feeling of like everybody witnessing that. I guess for a lot of people, that's Minecraft as well. Like it's just, I've never gotten into Minecraft. I but just wanted to bring that up. Like that's one of the things that I love about Minecraft is when you, you know, create a world and you bring your friends into it and just see what they do, see how they... Yeah make something really amazing um the only thing that i wish minecraft would allow is for uh because the way that it currently works is whoever builds the world they you can only play it if they're on and they load it up okay, so you, yeah. you can't you can't be like hey you know let's get 10 of us together we'll create a world and then whenever anyone wants to get it on there they can go ahead and like they can yeah. load it up and it saves in the cloud and then when i load it up there'll be new things and i can be surprised which would be awesome yeah you can't do that with console minecraft and uh, that's another thing that i should probably mention for a lot of you know for, for everyone who's watching i don't have a gaming pc I'm, I'm a console gamer uh i would love to get a gaming pc at some point but that's you know further down the line yeah. but yeah so i'm strictly console yeah. um and that's one of the things that's missing from uh the console experience and hopefully that'll be added in one day i I don't know, but you know, maybe. Yeah. I just added another light because I realized that half my face is in shadow. Hopefully yeah, I, this little thing will help. <laughs> You're all good. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I just want to quickly think as well, because um, yeah, we talked about like, as I said, the first horror game um, and you said Simon's Quest, but like, and I mean, I'm not trying to undermine that. Okay. Like, Simon's Quest is not a great all, game, ahead. but like, did that scare you? Like, or, yes. or like when I say, really? Yeah, 100%. I suppose when I, I think about the, it, yeah. And I know exactly, I can tell you exactly what scared me. The game itself didn't scare me. Um, playing through the game, I was perfectly fine. It didn't worry me. I wasn't scared at all. What scared me was the music when you had yes. to put in the password to get back to where you were. Yes, that scared me. Holy shit! I get that. Uh, there was this this uh, hip hop artist that I was really into a while back, and he used that as one of the samples for one of his tracks, the Castlevania Two password input music, and yeah. it's it's fucking it's crazy, it's, man. It's just weird because it's do 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 do, and then randomly, <laughs> and it's I don't know what it was, but as a kid, I was like trying to put in the password as quickly as I can. I was like, get me out of here. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, it just, that scared me. Uh, but the um, game itself, it never did. Uh, Friday the 13th for that. Oh, wow, game, yeah. I, I also played that and that one, it didn't, it didn't really scare me. Um, it, 
it was startling. I mean, because they because Jason jump- would just appear. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, they put in jump scares. Like you'd be you'd be you know, here's your counselor like running and throwing <laughs> stones at the zombies, and then suddenly Jason would fucking fly <laughs> right by you and injure you, and you're like, where the fuck did he come from? <laughs> like that was the annoying shit or like you're on a boat and you're like let me just canoe through here and zombies are you know doing their thing and then suddenly jason bursts out of the water and you're like really <laughs> give me a break um oh man I, so, again i missed a lot of those early horror experiences like i didn't really have the nes like genesis even mega drive even i mean as i say super castlevania 4 i guess but i wouldn't have considered that particularly scary like for well, it's, me it's horror but it's not scary yeah yeah that's it's true fine. yeah, yeah exactly it's perfectly fine it's a horror game that is not scary which is which is okay like the binding of isaac is a horror game but it's not scary yeah true and it's but it's the same as when we refer to movies because like the amount of times i've heard people argue and i find it absolutely ridiculous about like the rocky horror picture show that they're like it's not a horror and i'm like it's literally got horror in the title and it's about sci-fi and crazy fucking professors and yeah it's yeah, a it's, horror I, while it is a musical and it's crazy and whatever it's it's horror. that's that's where su- subjectivity and objectivity come into play yeah. and what people find scary is completely subjective True. uh and just because like for example killer clowns from outer space never scared me it's a horror movie yeah 100%. exactly uh troll 2 is not scary in the slightest <laughs> it is a horror film and a perfect uh, example of what we talked about earlier, which is so bad it's so good. bad that it's good. Yeah. <laughs> but like um like ready or not is not it's not scary. What a movie it's though. It's phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. It's absolutely a horror movie. Oh uh, so the this idea that horror has to be scary is is I think misguided. I think the people who believe that horror must be scary are those who are either elitists and therefore I don't care. What they have yeah. to say is, I'm not interested in speaking with elitists of any kind, uh, or it's people who are getting into horror and who are learning about it. And those yeah. are the people that I'm really excited to talk to, because then you can have that discussion of you don't have to be scared to to think of it as horror, and that's fine. I mean, a great example of this, because again, right, just I want to clarify, right, John came over from um, the US, John and Ariel came over and were on set for The Perished, helped out in loads of different departments, helped out in so many ways on the film, helping get it made. Um, But when you were here, you met Paul Fitzgerald, who at the time did not like horror. He said, like, I don't like horror, not into horror, it's not my bag. Um, Right after we shot The Perished, he went and he's went to the premiere of The Hole in the Ground, which he was like, yeah, I kind of liked it. But when we were in Kansas City together, me and him were chatting a lot, and I was like, he was telling me about films that he loved, like Saw, like Jaws. like, And I was like, dude, those are horror movies. like, And he's like, no, they're not. I'm like, man, like, those are, think of Jaws, dude. Think of the music. Did it. Did it. I was yeah. like, even if it's not scary, it's suspense. It's, it's, it's like... It's, Jaws is Jaws is effectively a slasher yeah. with a shark. <laughs> yeah, it's literally the same plot more or less as like Halloween Friday the Thirteenth with a shark. <laughs> yeah, but it's, like, no, go ahead. <laughs> no, but I, so it's like that. It's great because he got to open his eyes at that point to like, oh wow, there's a lot more beyond what I think of as horror. Yeah. Too hard. No, I'm still a little bit like that. As you just heard, I'm a little bit like that with games. I still think, like, for me, I'm like, oh, the first horror game I ever played in my head is, like, Resident Evil, because that was the first one where, like, the jobs, dogs jumped through the window and it scared the shit out of me. But when I think yeah. about it, I'm like, you're totally right, because I would have played before that Ghouls and Ghosts, which is fucking terrifying because it was so hard. Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> and Decap Attack on the Sega, Meg- Sega Genesis, Sega Mega Drive yeah. for us. Um, like where you're a guy throwing his fucking decapitated head at people like to hurt them. Like I mean, even something like, you know, zombies ate my neighbors. Yeah, it, exactly. It's, it's such a comical, funny, lighthearted game that is set in a horror world. It's in a way, it's kind of like has the same feel as something like Zombieland or Shaun yeah. of the Dead. Like just because it's you're laughing doesn't mean it's not horrific. It's so true. Like, as I say, I think uh, sometimes you said about the like people who are maybe elitist and maybe people who are just getting into horror. I think as well, sometimes there's people that are just genuinely misguided or don't, context is off. Because that's what it is with me. Like, I think sometimes about like, 
And like, it's funny because my favorite horror movies are not jump scare focused, are not. I love suspense. I love uh, atmosphere. Atmosphere to me is everything. I don't give a fuck. Yeah. Again, even with games, man, you put me in a spooky woods with a flashlight. And if the atmosphere is incredible, I don't give a shit about what else is in the game. I'll just walk around that thing, just turning my flashlight everywhere, just being like, Ooh, like, I mean, a great game like that, which isn't, again, isn't a horror game, but like, it has this feeling of isolation, loneliness, which to me is horrific, is like gone home, where like you're just walking around this house discovering these elements of somebody's life. And it feels this like, as I say, you're like, oh, this is so bizarre and off-putting. And I think I think to that, you know, an argument could be made that what sets Resident Evil 4 apart from Resident Evil 6 is atmosphere because you, oh, yeah. you play through Resident Evil 6 and in a way they're they're functionally very yeah. similar games you know it's going around shooting a bunch of enemies and trying to complete your objective functionally they play very very similarly um, but Resident Evil 4 really wanted to create an atmosphere that made you unsettled and uncomfortable mm. and it worked really really well at doing that uh, whereas Resident Evil 6 was like, we just want you to kill people. And the atmosphere itself is not really that important. The Leon campaign started out feeling oh, yeah, like, same. like a straight yeah. up horror game. And I was like, this is awesome. But then you play the Chris one and I'm like, oh, it's Call of Duty. Gears of War. Yeah. With, with, with zombies. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that's, it speaks directly to what you're talking about. Atmosphere can set up so much of a game and to, the, to the point that it will completely change how you actually play it. Definitely. And like the thing is, I know it's like we talked about four and six, right? But five, the interesting thing with five is that even though it doesn't quite succeed at the things that it tries to do, it still does have a sense of atmosphere. Like again, in those opening, because I played five again recently and that opening, you're walking around this village. And I'm and playing through it right now with a friend. <laughs> no way. Oh, I yeah. love I, I, In co-op, I think five is one of the best in the series being on it. Like for a co-op experience, it's so much yes. fun. Um, Hands down. But like that intro, like I was playing it again recently. I was like, shit, this is, this is scary, bro. Like, because you've got like people beating the shit out of somebody on the street and then you go into this back alley and there's just like carcasses thrown everywhere and you're like, this is setting up this real sense of like the dreads. Now, admittedly, and, the game and, goes and, off the rails. <laughs> well, but what makes it so, what made it also so fascinating was that it was all in bright light. And exactly. Daytime horror. Make, yeah. And they still managed to make it unsettling. Like these people are killing those around them in bright daylight. They don't care. Like Resident Evil 4. Yeah. When it starts, you're in the day. But it's overcast. It's gloomy. It's gray. It's cloudy yeah. day. It's gray. Like, at least there is the illusion that there is, you know, you can hide behind your actions. But And then it becomes night throughout a lot of the game. And just there, something about Resident Evil 5 taking place primarily during the day made it so much more interesting. And yeah, that mm. kind of in a way it took away from the atmosphere because ooh dark spooky uh but at the same time as you said daytime horror the fact that they're willing to be so brazenly violent in the yeah. light of day is genuinely unsettling oh like it's it's one thing that i would say right and people okay the resident evil fan base and now i've met some amazing friends through the resident evil fan base some of my best friends that i've met over the past year have come through cosplayers artists you know, voice actors from within yeah. the games and stuff. But a lot of the Resident Evil fan base drive me fucking bananas because there's, no right, I understand it. It's a game that's gone on, I think, coming up on, yeah, two and a half generations, you know, it's, or two and a half decades. So it is like, what you have is you have people who have been playing it for 30 years, who more or less, that are like, this is the way it should be. Then you have people who have played it in the last five years and are like, this is the way it should be. You have people who played it in 2005 who are like, this is the way it should have been. And so I get it. I get that there's this big generational rift with Resident Evil. But the, what blows me away is that Capcom, like people do not give them enough credit for it, that they have been able to, unlike, and I love Silent Hill. I love the Silent Hill games and I wish they got treated better, but they didn't. But like Capcom have managed to, Resident Evil 1, 2, 3, Code Veronica, 
they had one entirely type of a, a type of game. Then they did four, five, six uh, revelations, different type of game. You know, third person over the shoulder, and now we've gone to the seven village and whatever it'll come after, and it's different again. It's first person. It's a totally different vibe. It's more atmospheric. It's but like they've just reinvented themselves constantly. They don't care. Yeah, because because that's the thing. You know, I I'm like you. I love the Silent Hill games. Oh, yeah. Aside from what was it called, Book of Memories, the yeah, PSP the Vita, one that was like a yeah. top-down dungeon crawler, crawler kind of Diablo yeah. Silent Hill. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> w- w- which I never played, and I would love to, but I, I never played it. But um, apart from apart from that, they were all effectively the same thing. It was all a person gets pulled into Silent Tortured. Hill and to figure it out and go to the various locations and see the horrible monsters. They were effectively the same thing. And mm. that's coming, and me saying that, that's coming from someone who fucking loves the Silent oh, yeah. Hill games. And I'm one of those ones that is a firm defender of Silent Hill Downpour, the first one that didn't have a Kira Yamaoka. Yes, I yes. loved Daniel that. Licks, Daniel Licks fucking soundtrack. I recently played that on stream and I got loads of people watching that stream who were like, oh, this game sucks, right? And I was like, did you ever play it? And they're like, no, but I heard how shit it was. And by it's the so end good. of it, by the end of it, they were like, man, and I do agree, right? A lot of them said the same thing, which I do agree with, which is they said, you know, if this was released as anything other than a silent, like if this had just come out and just been called Downpour and it was just a horror game, people would have probably, it would have probably gotten a much more acclaim. I think that, I think that in this instance, I'm actually good friends with um, Brian Gomez, who was the lead designer on it. I think in this case, having Silent Hill attached to it made people have these expectations that they then were like, where's Pyramid Head? Where's this? Where's all these things that I connect to the franchise? And it's like, again, like gaming is... Gaming Anyone? is full of gatekeepers and elitists and, yeah, like, entitled That's people. <laughs> That's the thing. It's like, it reminds me, like, like I said, I'm playing through Resident Evil 5 again with um, with a friend of mine. Uh, it's actually uh, Trace Thurman, uh, one half of the Horror Queers podcast. Oh, awesome. Bloody Disgusting. Yeah. Um, and we, we love the Resident Evil games. We love the Resident Evil movies in different ways. I think Resident Evil Apocalypse is the best of the Resident Evil movies. He thinks Extinction, and I and we each think that the other is fucking insane for thinking that. <laughs> um, but we're, we were playing through Resident Evil 5, and we're like, hey, look, it's the Executioner. Remember when they put him in that one Resident Evil movie for no good fucking reason? Oh, hey, it's Jill with the jewel in her chest. That makes sense in the story here. But then remember when they did it in the movies with no context whatsoever? Like... We're just shredding the movies because it just makes no sense. But like, that's the kind of mentality that makes me furious. I loved this character from this one game. So they have to be in everything else. No, Pyramid Head belonged in Silent Hill 2. Yeah. Because that was, that was a character integral to James Sunderland's story. Yep. Pyramid Head would not have made sense in the story of Heather Mason, nope. for example. Not at all. Or Travis Grady. It yep. wouldn't have made sense. Uh, and... That's why the characters have to reflect what each person is going through. And that's why I love Downpour. Because Downpour, I felt... Downpour was the one that I felt did something really interesting and different where it felt almost like an open world Silent Hill game that actually wanted to be open world. Silent Hill 1 and 2... They made Had the illusion the again. Silent Hill, yeah. But it was still kind of linear. It was still kind of like, hey, uh, you know, you found the key in the alley. Now go to the apartment building. And but, you know, meander around. We're not going to really point out the way you have to figure it out. But it doesn't. But you can't go in anywhere or do really anything. Yeah, yeah. The other areas don't really matter. Whereas Downpour was like, fuck it. Let's have side quests. Yeah. Exactly. And I was like, this is amazing. This is so cool. And the yeah. other thing that I loved about Downpour was that the main character, and I can't remember his name. Murphy. Like, Murphy Pendleton. Murphy, Murphy Pendleton, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Murphy felt like the most human character in the entire Silent Hill yes. series because he actually was afraid. When you were running from oh, yeah. that distortion, he was screaming. And I was like, I'd fucking scream too. I When, when I was replaying it on stream, people kept saying, he looks, he looks... Almost exactly. And it's funny because it's kind of true because I was replaying before this, right? They said he looks really like Henry from Silent Hill 4. And it's yep. funny because I looked and I was like, oh shit, he does look really like Henry. But I just played 4 beforehand. Uh, I, I still haven't 
finished replaying it, but I was playing it again. That's a that's a complicated game to get through. Um, yeah, Jesus. Uh, but yeah, I. But I was like, but Henry and do not get me wrong. As we say, I'm like you. I love all the Silent Hill games more or less for their own reasons, except for Homecoming. It's the only one I'm not a huge fan of. But what I would say, yeah, okay. like what yeah. I would say is that like Henry is kind of a personality void. Like he he is very much like whereas Murphy, I, this is the argument I kept saying to people. I was like, yeah, but like Henry was like a blank slate character. Like Murphy, I actually give a shit about this dude. I actually want to know his story. I want to find out what happened to his family. What you know, like I I care. And if a game can yeah. make me do that, it's successful. That's the way I look yeah. at it. And the music is phenomenal. <laughs> the atmosphere is so good. The creatures are, for bizarre. the most part, <laughs> bizarre and, and scary. The combat is shit, but what combat is good in the Silent Hill franchise? And it shouldn't be good. That's what always pisses me off. People are like, oh, the combat shit in this. I'm like, man, you're meant to be an everyman or whatever. Like you're Silent Hill games aren't scary if you're fucking Leon Kennedy and you can jump out windows and kick people, roundhouse kick things into the face. Like imagine, like <laughs> imagine, if you will, imagine for just one moment, if you were Chris Redfield and you were able to punch a fucking boulder <laughs> in Silent Hill. At that point, Pyramid Head would be like, "I'm gonna go." <laughs> but that's, like, yeah, I, I don't get. I understand. I I fully understand the idea of wish fulfillment in being like, I really want to be powerful and strong and capable. But that's not hard. Well, that's not survival horror. But that's not, but that's not, that's not Silent Hill. Yeah. I mean, in, in some of the, in some of the Resident Evil games, absolutely. That's, that's what it is. You are a killing machine, but in a lot of them, you're not. And even in, in, and even in Resident Evil, there has always been to some degree, like if you look at, even from the first game on, while there wasn't like a strict leveling up system or anything like that, there was a clear sense of, okay, my character now can use this. I know it's only like, whatever. Now they have a shotgun. Now they have a flamethrower. Now they have a grenade launcher. Now yeah. they have a fucking rocket launcher. Like Silent Hill was never that. Silent Hill was like, you've got a pipe. Yeah. You've got a you've got a slightly bigger pipe. <laughs> <laughs> you've got a pipe with a nail taped to it. Yes, yes. And it was like, and you were like, oh fuck, awesome. I've got a pipe with a nail taped to it. Sweet. And then uh, and then they were like, oh, you've got a gun. And you're like, awesome, I have a gun. And now it's like, I need ammunition. Oh shit, where's where's that? And then, you know, you shoot things and they don't die, and you're like, oh yeah. That's because, you know, Harry Mason is a fucking random nobody who was going on vacation with his daughter and now he has a gun and he's like, I don't know how to use this thing. Yeah. And it's like you're shooting some fucking eldritch being that just is a shapeless form. And you're yeah. Like, like, you're not shooting a zombie where it's like, oh, shoot it in the head and it dies. You're shooting a thing that's like, where's the head? I, I, think, this is, I think this is the, the problem that I always had with the discussion of combat from Resident Evil to Silent Hill. In Resident Evil 1, you are a member of STARS. Yeah, you're a military. You special Tactics and Rescue... Uh, services. Services, yeah. Uh, you are a trained officer that got even more training to be a part of this elite unit. You are an elite badass. Yeah. So when you get ammo, it makes sense that you can make the most out of it. When you're in Silent Hill 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or any of them, uh, except for Homecoming where you're a literal soldier, um, it makes all the sense in the world that you're like, I have a gun and I, I, I might have done a paintball retreat, maybe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, or I might have played some FPS video games. Like if I'm Heather yeah. Mason, maybe maybe Heather played Doom. You know, like that's about yeah, like that would make sense. But at the same time, like asking for any of the main characters yeah. of the Final franchise to be badasses is fundamentally misunderstanding who they are and what those games are trying to do. It's it's interesting because again, going back, like I'm I'm gonna kind of like. Going back to the whole, what we were talking yeah. about a while ago, about horror being so all-encompassing as a genre, right? The great thing is, like, you can have something like Silent Hill, which is about almost like, yeah, a disempowerment, like taking everything away from me. Like, great, I would consider, like, the Metroid games sci-fi horror as well. Like, I, yeah, I think... absolutely. Um, 
because I remember playing Metroid Prime and like when Rigby appeared, that actually was terrifying and stuff. But again, Metroid is like a lot of these other games. It, it is the, the wish fulfillment. You get gradually more powerful. You get that scale. Like you can feel it building and you're like, oh, I'm, I'm I get my energy. Badass. Tank. I get the plasma yeah. balls. I get the rocket and launcher. Ridley kicks your ass at the very start of the game. But then by the end, he shows up and you're like, oh, you're dead. I'm going to fucking kill you. Yeah. You're not scared that, anymore. What was that one creature? I want to say it was in Super Metroid where like, it was it was that was craze approaching, and it would it was like with its long arm was slamming yeah. down, and then you killed it, and it melted into the lava, and then when you went the other way, because that's where you were supposed to go, yeah. it suddenly bur- its skeleton burst yeah. through the wall and then crumbled. That's a fucking jump scare if there that's, ever yeah. was one. <laughs> Absolutely, but like what I, what I'm saying is right. You get games like that. Uh, where there's a sudden hill, where there's disempowerment, you've got Metroids where there's this gradual sense of empowerment. And then you get something like Doom Eternal, where it starts off and it's like, you are the Doom Slayer, you are fucking, you are the most badass thing that has ever existed. And you just exist to listen to heavy metal music and kill demons. That's all you do, buddy. And it's still a horror game. It's still a yeah. horror game, but it's fucking Magnificent! Like nothing gives you more empowerment than just being the Doom Marine and just punching shit and chainsawing shit and just tearing stuff apart. And like, you know, and and it reminds me, like, I think why people expected the combat in Silent Hill to be so much stronger is because it, it, it kind of was the next biggest survival horror after Resident Evil. Yeah, those two are all were always spoken about. Yeah, exactly. In the same breath. Um, but then you stop and think about games like Outlast or yeah. Alien Isolation. And the whole point is that you are powerless yeah, and that you have to hide and you have to run and you have to be clever. And I think that people forgot that that was, that's a form of strength in and of itself. And yeah. And I mean, it goes back to like, it does go back, but they weren't popular games. Stuff like, I mean... Clock Tower or the early Alone in the Darks, like they were not. I've seen a lot of people bring up this whole. There's this real new trend, and it's kind of frustrating to me of people who are again kind of. It feels a little bit elitist. People being like, Resident Evil wouldn't be anything without Alone in the Dark, and I'm like, yeah, well, Alone in the Dark wouldn't be anything without the works of H.P. Lovecraft. Everything's influenced by what came before it. Get the fuck over it. Like, yeah, it's that's that's such a stupid point. Like, in my opinion, um, but like the thing is, those original Alone in the Dark games they also weren't massively popular. I know that people look at it now and say, oh, it was this originator. I remember at the time, nobody fucking, I, no one played it. Hindsight no. was 2020. I mean, yeah, I, you know, a, a friend and I were talking about some really amazing games that we loved um back when i was doing pc gaming like uh clive barker's undying or american mcgee's alice or phantasmagoria 2 you know these i love all of those games those games that were so ahead of their time and did some really amazing things that just weren't popular like like people forget that clive barker's undying uh was going to come out on xbox and there was going to be a multiplayer mode made for it and it was scrapped due to lack of sales. But now people are, are revisiting it and relearning it because of GOG and everyone's like, it's so amazing. It's so, you know, incredible. Ahead of its time. Yeah. yeah, but you're 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 late to the party. Yeah. Um and and, and you're looking at it through a lens of, you know, I'm I'm not saying you're late to the party as a way of saying you don't get to enjoy it. By all means, enjoy it, love it. Yeah. I want you to I want you to enjoy it. But keep in mind that you're looking at it through a lens of gaming of how almost like 20 years since a lot of those games were released. So you have a very different perspective, whereas we were playing it when it came out and we were appreciating it for what it was doing at the time, which, you know, a lot of people get to do with games nowadays, like Cyberpunk 2077 and The Last of Us 2, you know, all these games that are doing really amazing things. I'm not saying those experiences are gone. I'm just saying we're looking at it from different experiences and from different vantage points. And so there's a bit of frustration mixed in with excitement when people revisit those games, but have complaints. Cause I'm like, yeah. you don't understand. You're not putting those complaints in perspective. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like it, it's, it's similar to when, I mean, I think the games are definitely becoming closer. We've always had the game versus movie discussion, but even in terms of that, even in terms of games are finally starting to have cult classics, like games are finally starting to have that 
20 because also games are a really young medium that's another thing that people yeah. often forget like films go back to the late like the turn of the century effectively uh, like the last one whereas games literally 19 really commercially late 70s i guess like yes. for pong in the and, arcades and and that's home gaming. Like, yeah. you know, there, there were arcades in the earlier 70s, but home gaming didn't really kind of explode, I would say, until the 80s. Ar early to mid 80s. Yeah. Like, it was yeah. when the Atari suddenly showed up in people's homes. And, like, I mean, and people that's forget that gaming almost died. Like, home oh, yeah. gaming. Home gaming because of ET. Died. <laughs> and, and then, uh, and then what was it? Um, and then PlayStation 1. I think it was the PlayStation 1 that completely revolutionized and changed how gaming worked. And it's even marketed, exploded. marketing. Uh, the thing about PlayStation 1 was it wasn't even specific. Yes, you had the CDs, which also, it had the best audio quality and it was able to do this. But like, I remember my sister did not care about video games. Like she was not a gamer. I had been a gamer yeah. since I was a kid. But like when PlayStation came out, she was like, do you have that game? And I was like, what can she's like, wipe out. And I'm like, uh, yeah, I have it. And so she's like, I want to fucking play it now. Like, because she was like, techno music? Fucking crazy visuals? This is everything. I love. Like, it was appealing yeah. to an audience of people who were up to this point completely anti video games. They were like, ugh, games are for nerds. Suddenly, like, PlayStation came out and people were like, Colin McRae Rally, Gran Turismo, Wipeout, Tekken, fucking tech, you know, and people suddenly they started to care about like you would see people start having Lara Croft tattoos or fucking and you were like oh that's badass um, yeah and it's so true like I do think the PlayStation was where video games rounded a corner to some extent up from being like th those are kids things to like being seen as a mature medium like people going oh, well beginning to be seen as a which I still think that even today there's a lot of people that don't see video games as a mature medium which if you ask me in the age where we've had experiences like the last of us part two and many many other games uh, I mean, uh here's the thing i think gaming has been a mature medium since you could argue the super nintendo yeah uh, but definitely since uh playstation one uh because you know and i think that the people who are sitting here still holding on to this idea that gaming is not mature are the they are now the minority. They used to be oh, the majority, definitely, yeah. but they are now so far in the minority that I, I just don't care. Same. They're the and like, they're the type of people that would scoff at the colorful, bright, fun games that were they're like, this is so childish and juvenile. And now you look at it and Fortnite has taken over the world. And Fortnite is huge yeah. and everybody in their cat plays fucking Fortnite. You go down the local gyms and half the lads are like, oh man, I was fucking unreal on Fortnite the other night, you know, like, or what, or COD or whatever it is. But they have this thing that, like, it, almost everybody now, I remember I used to love when I worked in GameStop, you would get to identify, this was in the mid-2000s, you'd get, like, a rugby jack guy who'd be very, like, you know, big, burly rugby jack guy and would be quite ashamed. You could see it, like, coming into the shop to buy, like, the World of Warcraft expansion. Like, he was, like, if anybody sees me, it was like he was going to be outed for something. Like, he was he was terrified. And yeah. I was, like, in my head, I was, like, dude, it's okay to like World of Warcraft. Like, that dude pro now is probably doing really awesome for himself because he's probably embraced that he loves video games and, you know what I mean? But, like, I just remember even that's only, as I said, 15 years ago that it was a case that, like, this guy had this idea of, well, the type of person that I am, I can't be seen to be playing World of Warcraft. That's that's losers, you know what I mean? That was this yeah. vibe. Um, and like now I look and my nephews and that the generation that's there now, the better you are at video games, the more awesome you are. It's it's completely... <laughs> and, and do you remember how it used to be that you almost kind of were shoot into specific... You, you had to play specific games. There were the, you know, the, the, the boy games and there were the girl games or the games that like, oh, you don't want to play that. That's that's lame, things like that. And now oh, that's for like, kids. I don't care. That's for yeah, kids. Exactly. And yeah, exactly. And now like I got my PlayStation 5 and one of the first things I did was I loaded up Bug Snacks. So I'm like, oh, I don't give a shit. But did you play Bug Snacks? Because that gets really dark and really deep. <laughs> I didn't go all the way through, but I was going through and I was like, this is clever. And it's also, it is a little fucked up. 
Oh man, I will just say to you that by the end of Bug Snacks, I was nearly as much of a wreck as I was with The Last of Us 2, and that's not what I signed up for with that game. Like, I was like, I am signing up for a cute, meme game about eating bugs that are also snacks. And yeah. by the end of it, I was like, like, fucking, if I was a child that played through Bug Snacks, it would be Kinder Trauma Central. Like, it goes... It I need to look, I need to download it again and, and go through it. <laughs> Do it. I platinumed it because I got obsessed with it. But it goes, it, man. It's it's a body horror. That's all I'm going to say. We're talking about games that are horrors that not really horror, or whatever. Like, Bug Snacks is a horror. By the end of it, you will be like, holy shit, he wasn't lying. This is a horror game. When did that happen? <laughs> so yeah. Um, all right, you convinced me. I'm going to give it another go. <laughs> yep, I'll do it. Yeah, it's a wild experience. Actually, this is a good place though, because talking about the PS5 and stuff, we're gonna like um because we're kind of coming to the end of the, this and stuff, but what excites you about the future of gaming? Like what what is it that gets you like pumped about where we're going? Yeah. Um, I think what's getting me pumped is I think what we're seeing is at least from the last game awards. We're seeing that older titles and older experiences are making a, a, a little bit of a comeback. Um, nostalgia, I'll, I'll say this, nostalgia is very much a driving force when it comes to the video game world. And, you know, for the longest time, for example, I was clamoring for either an HD remake or another entry in the Dead Space franchise. And now they announced the Callisto Protocol from oh, the same developers, oh, yes. and it looks like Dead Space 4, and yeah. like a return to Dead Space 1 and 2, not Dead Space 3, which I'm sitting here going, yes, please, carry on. Yes. Um, you've got, uh, what was the other one? You know, they're the remastering Ghouls and Goblins, or Ghouls and Ghosts. Yes. Uh, and I can't wait to see how many people are going to be like, oh, I'm going to do just fine with that game. Why is this so hard? <laughs> you mean it's going to be like the Mega Man Legacy Collection all over again? <laughs> it, people are going to be fucking destroyed by it, and see, I cannot pe wait. People think Dark Souls is hard, right? But those people don't remember <laughs> what those games were like. Because I'm playing all the Souls games at the moment, man. Like, I'm, I'm obsessed with them now. <laughs> I think Dark Souls is hard to play fucking Ninja Gaiden. <laughs> Talk about a game that made me throw my fucking controller around. <laughs> yeah. my, mine was Echo the Dolphin, man. Echo the Dolphin made me love my oh. controller off a wall. <laughs> Talk about it. Okay. Talk about a game that was like, we're not going to hold your hand, slash flipper. <laughs> you want to beat Echo the Dolphin? Fucking figure it out. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and like, it's so funny because oh. when I ask, you'll appreciate this because you know Graham as well, but when I asked Graham Skipper what video game edit movie he would like to make, he chose Echo the Dolphin. I remember <laughs> I tweeted about it and he, uh, and he chimed in and then... Uh, Aaron Kuntz also got pulled into it, and like we were all sitting here like, yes, let's do an Echo movie. <laughs> it's so glorious, because he was like, but he raised some really good points, which is by the end of Echo the Dolphin, again, this keeps looping back, but like by the end of Echo the Dolphin, you go down into like this Geiger-esque fucking underwater maze with alien faces and shit, yeah. and it's like, where did this go? Again, you're a kid, you get this game but a cute dolphin, and then you end up in fucking Geiger's hell, like... <laughs> Remember Streets of Rage 2 where you were fighting literal xenomorphs? Yes, Like, when yes. the fuck did that happen? Like, oh, it's Streets of Rage 2, I've got to clean the streets of crime, and apparently xenomorphs have invaded <laughs> Earth and are living in the fucking funhouse at the carnival. Yeah. I love that those old beat em ups though where they would just create assets and they just tie them together however the fuck they did. They were just like, yeah. we got this. Let's just throw it in. It's fine. <laughs> they did that in Contra. They were like, okay, yeah, you're in the jungle. You're killing a bunch of like insurgents. By the way, here's a fucking alien monstrosity <laughs> with four arms. And you're like, yeah, yeah, sure. Of course. Of course that makes sense. Contra's another weird one because you guys had it as Contra. And then we over here, because of censors, it was like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for you guys in the US. We had Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles because Ninja was too violent. Um, man, I have lot never heard of this, and this is fascinating. <laughs> there was Go a on. lot of crazy censorship in the early 90s in Ireland and the UK. 
And one of the things was, as I say, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. And then the other one was uh, Contra, right? Contra, they were like, oh, it's too violent. You can't have these military guys shooting people and stuff. So we got Probotector, and Probotector is literally Contra, the exact same game, just instead of humans, they're robots. <laughs> Everybody's a robot. Um, <laughs> so we had... It's, sure, it's pro- you know Probot- what? <laughs> Fucking fine. <laughs> What's weird is now Contra's huge and Contra's international, and so like Contra Hardcore, whatever, like all these yeah. Contra games come out. But for me, in the back of my head, I'm like, it's Probotector, man. It's Probotector. Like, it's because that was all I knew because of this crazy censorship bullshit that we had to deal with. Um, yeah. Um, That's fucking crazy, but I love it. Because, <laughs> you know, it, it's like, uh, you know, when, um, you know, in the US, we're like, yeah, Super Mario Brothers 2. And in Japan, they're like, you mean Doki Doki Do? Yeah, exactly. There's so many of these little stories. Um, and a big one, right? Me and my friends, diehard Final Fantasy VII fans, always have been, always will be. Six and three? uh, For me, uh, oh, well, yeah, there was six and three as well. Yeah, that was one I loved. Like, Final Fantasy VI is my second favorite of the entire series. Like, seven is my favorite, then followed by six, and then nine. But um, with seven, when it came out over here, she was called Eris. A-E-R-I-S. Yep, I remember that. But then in the US, she was Aerith. A-E-R-I-T-H. Yep. Now, because of the remake, she's now Aerith everywhere. And people are like, her name is Aerith, get it right. And I'm like, man, you don't know. I've got 30 years of baggage in here of calling her Aerith. Like, don't don't get pissed at me because I'm I'm now saying it wrong by the standards that are now being said. That's Localization the thing, I remember. Me up. When when FF7 came out, I didn't have a PS1. I only got it later. Yeah. But um, fuck, I loved it. Like whenever I went to my friend's place, I was like, put on FF7. I don't give yeah. a shit. I will sit here silent as the grave. You play it. I just want to watch it. Yes. Um, and I was like, that was back when the internet was shit before Google. But I was still going to FF7 websites and like, but so I was seeing Aris and Aerith. Yeah. Both, you know, so I I knew of both of them, which is why I was always confused, like, which one is it? Um, and then Square answered that question by naming her Aerith in the remake and just making it yeah. a hard... Which, by the way, I want to ask you, what did you think of the FF7 remake? So, okay, I will actually do this because there is a video on my channel, which is, mo- A, there's a review you can check out. Well, not you, specifically, I'll tell you, but people can check it out. <laughs> and yep. then, B, uh, also, I did my top five games of the year and I put Final Fantasy 7 Remake at the top of my list uh, above The Last of Us Part 2 which was a very very hard decision for me of all the decisions I made and it basically boiled down to subjectivity of, 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 over objectivity yeah. because yeah. I understand that by for all intents and purposes The Last of Us 2 is a, is a it's definitely a game that's going to advance gaming more in my opinion in a lot of ways but for me emotionally Final Fantasy VII has me over a barrel and it's just, it controls. And like, I loved what they did with the meta approach. The fact that they use remake as not just, it's not just that it is the Final Fantasy VII remake. It's that remake is the subheading. That is, it like, it's literally talking about remaking the world of Final Fantasy VII. Like, and I, I mean, I don't, I don't think any of this even really quantifies as spoilers or anything like that, but like, I just love that they, they didn't just go, hey, let's just fucking do an exact carbon copy of the original game. And even beyond that, when I first heard that they were going to just do it in parts, I was like, how are they going to do Midgar as a whole game? That's like three, seven hours max, yeah. like in the original yeah. game. I was like, how are they going to? And like, I played 60 hours of F07 Remake and it never once felt like padding or they just fluff stuff out. Or it was like, oh no, they've gone in and they've actually... That's that's where we differ because oh, okay. I really enjoyed a lot of FF7 remake and like you I I love the original I think it's it's one of my favorite games probably yeah. throughout gaming history so I loved FF7 and FF7 remake there were some things that were just incredible and the fleshing out of Midgar was beautiful um, 
the 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 ghost train station yeah. was I don't know what it was, but that whole area, I was like, I fucking love this. Yeah. The combat system was okay. I probably was not doing it as well as could be. Um, but I definitely started to feel like there were parts of the game where it was padded, where it felt like they were just doing, they were stretching things out for the sake of making it a 30 to 40 to 50 to 60 hour experience to justify the $60 uh price tag um overall like i had a i had a very good time with it i will yeah. say that the final like two three hours were so long and those fights just kept going and going and it i was sitting there at one point going am i ever gonna not be fighting here <laughs> <laughs> like this is this is absurd like this is it's, just going it's... on <clears throat> Wait it's so long. funny. It's so funny because yeah, it is. It this is what I love about this stuff. It is all so subjective because like again, yeah. I we were having such different experiences at that point because I'm sitting there going like, oh, well, I'm not losing my shit over these like totally fan fictiony fucking like finale like is what I would describe it as like where yeah. it's just like oh, yeah. imagine if this happened and imagine if that and like again I can totally understand how that could grind on people and not necessarily work and all the rest of it. But for me, I was just like, yeah, hook it to my fucking veins. This is all I've wanted. <laughs> no, and, like, and like I said, like a lot of it, I was playing yeah. it and I was like, yes, this is, I I have been transported back. The falling of the plate is done amazingly. Like again, beautifully. that was, yeah. Beautifully. Like, um, like for example, like, you know how we think back to old games we played, and because we're so used to better graphics, we kind of make it look we nicer see it that in our way. mind. Yeah. Yeah. We see it look better. Um, you know, FF7 Remake was that experience only actually true, where <laughs> yeah. I was playing that old game and it looked better. Yeah. Uh, the voice acting was was so good in a lot of places. The I the music was stunning. Oh my God, although yes. I can, although I always knew when I was hearing a re arrangement, like a, a new rearrangement yeah. and re-recording of Nobu Uematsu's original work, and then something that wasn't on the original FF7 soundtrack. Like yeah. there, it was just, it was night and day for me. Oh, big could, time. Very yeah. clearly. That being like, said, it was still really great music. It's just, yeah. it was very, I, that was what I felt was that it was, half of it was, imbued with the magic of what I felt when I played the original and it was just fleshed out even more and made even more gorgeous and immersive and wonderful. And then the other half was these new voices who were creating stories that much, much like you say, could almost be fanfic Yeah, that they like, they're clearly fans of the original and they grew up with it and they love it. And so what they're bringing to it comes from a place of love and care and wonder. <clears throat> it just, it wasn't what I was hoping for, which again yeah. is fine. Yeah. Cause it's, it's subjectively my opinion and I'm of owning course. that. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's just, you know, I felt like there were places where it was clearly padded for length and other people like yourself say that it wasn't. And you know what? more power to you. I'm well, so happy that you loved it and that it was the experience that you wanted. Oh man, I say this all the time, right? There's so many games that I, like, there's a lot of games out there that I don't necessarily care for, right? Like, I, I'm not a COD guy. I've never been a COD guy. It's not a franchise. That I, lo I love me. the single player stories in Call of Duty. I, I can't, I'm not a good PvP player. <laughs> yeah, but even still, right, it doesn't matter that I don't, I'm not personally that into COD. If somebody is like, holy shit, uh, Cold Ops is coming, or Black Ops, no, Cold War is just uh, out. And Black Ops 3 or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're like, you know, Cold War has just come out. And I'm like, I like in my head, I'm like, I don't care. But I see how happy it makes them. I'm like, I'm not going to shit all over that. Like, that's another thing that I really want to get away from. I think what, to kind of go back to the thing about like what excites you about the future. For me, one of the things that excites, what makes me... I am hopeful about now it's it's not very evident at the moment not when you look at all the shit that happened last year with the last of us with everything but like i'm hopeful that we get to a point where yeah people can just start saying 
hey, I like my thing. You like your thing. I don't like your thing, but that's fine. Yeah. We like our things. Hundred percent, hundred percent, and I think that le- let people enjoy things. Yes, I think that's the most important thing, and let people find what they love and explore it at their own rate, like mm-hmm. at, at their own pace. You know, a great example: Ariel is not a gamer. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, she. Let me rephrase that: she wasn't a gamer, but she's getting into it now because she played the unholy hell out of both Ori games. And here's the thing. <laughs> Imagine someone who doesn't play games really all that much, who has never been a gamer, a consistent gamer, and then diving into Ori, considered one of the hardest platformers out there, and she fucking 100%ed the first game two, if not three times, and she beat the shit out of the second one and fucking loves them. And she recently beat Breath of the Wild. And I'm sitting here going, you're a fucking gamer. You're a gamer. You can't, yeah, at that point, you've beaten Breath of the Wild, you're a gamer. But to be honest, this is another one of those discussions that like, that, that a game... I've seen so many people that say, oh, my girlfriend's not really a gamer or whatever it is, or my, my boyfriend's not really a gamer, whatever. And then... I'm like chatting to them and they're like, oh my God, I'm addicted to Clash of Clans. And I'm like, you're a fucking gamer, bro. And they're yeah, like, no, exactly. it's a mobile game. It's just casual. It's not. And I'm like, it, man, I don't give a fuck whether you're playing tabletop games, whether you're playing fucking, like, I don't give a shit. Where If you're playing Cards Against Humanity, to me, you're a gamer. I'm sorry. Like, hey, like yo. There's a great example of that is how, and there was this really wonderful moment where, um, so Ariel was on a podcast um. I actually don't know if I should be mentioning this. Um, if, you, if you're not supposed to mention it, I can excise it. Don't worry. It'll be good. Well, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll say this. Ariel was on a podcast where she did a tabletop game. I'm not going to say which one. Uh, and I'm not going to say who it was with or anything like that. But uh, they did a tabletop game together. And it's and she had a blast with it. But she had never done it before. Yeah. Never had she done a tabletop game. So everything was brand new to her, including character creation, like literally rolling the die yeah. and figuring out your strength, intellect, charisma, like all these things. And then we, and then she was playing, there was a video game version of the tabletop game that she was playing. Okay. And when it started, you got to put points into certain criteria. And she was like, wait a minute, I fucking know these. I know these. And, and it was this really amazing and awesome it's moment. So good. She was like, I get this. I know what I need to do here. And like, That's sweet. yeah, she, she played that and is doing all real. And you know what? She's having a fucking blast with these days and playing with a bunch of friends uh, online is Fall Guys. And I'm oh, like, yeah. you're a gamer. You're a oh man. Gamer. Like, Except- exactly. Like, I think, um, I mean, even I'm similar with Kathy. Like, it's so funny. Kathy doesn't really play games all that often. But that's because she's busy. If she had time, she's has said herself numerous times, like because she's a she's a mother and she's working full time and she's got a bazillion things to do. I get it. I'm the layabout. She's the busy one. And Kathy, like she said, like when she had time, she like 100 percented all the same like Saints Row one, two, three, and four because she loves them. She played the sh- ever loving shit out of all the GTAs because she loves them. Those are her games. She likes just going into these big open worlds, uh, gangster stuff and just messing. Her favorite thing in the world is playing Saints Row 3 and beating the shit out of people with a giant purple dildo. That's that makes her happy. That's you know all what? that makes her own. Yeah. Each their own. I I personally like getting beaten by a giant rubber dildo, p- purple rubber dildo. I mean, so, some like to give, some like to receive. <laughs> But like, as you say, it's so funny because again, Kathy would be like, I'm not much of a gamer. And I'm like, no, but when you do play, you're gone. <laughs> like you you go off the reservation. Yeah. Um, and my mother growing up was always like, I'm not a gamer. She completed Super Mario Bros. 2. She completed Alex Kidd in Miracle World, which was a bastard game. Um, so many people, I think, do have this thing of I'm not. And they don't realize that there, that there's so many times where they have been are our gamers like any like Barry Barry constantly Barry's username a mutual friend of ours Barry Fah he was like yep. a DOP producer Barry's username is Baz not a gamer and like I look at Baz he has played I think something like 4,000 hours of Pokemon Go I think um, and I'm like you can't be Baz not a gamer and have played, he's played Minecraft Sky Factory you know all these and like he's like yeah but I don't play 
I don't play I real games. <laughs> we're from that generation where, when we were growing up, being a gamer was a was like the scarlet letter. It was a stigma. It was, I was you know, still, yeah. Negative. It and, was. You know, now, now it's it's a part of everyday life. Like now, everyone just expects. Like if you're, I would say thirty and under, everyone's like, oh, so what game are you playing? Yeah. Like you know, is it is it mobile? Is it console? Is it PC? Like whatever yeah. it is, like you're 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 playing something. You're the majority of people in that age are playing that. But we're from that generation where it it was something to be ashamed of until it wasn't. Yeah. And like I feel like I missed that transition, man. I feel like um because I feel like I was like the nerd who liked video games and then I looked at my nephews or my younger cousin growing up and they were suddenly like the cool kids that were good at video games. And I was like, when did this happen? Like, where, why did nobody alert me to this happening? Why did, yeah. We're cool it's, now? No, you're not cool. You're old. But <laughs> I think, I think when, you know, cool people started coming out as gamers, that's when, like when basketball players were playing a bunch of NBA 2K, you know, 11 or whatever. Yeah. When the when Vin Diesel was like, I'm a huge D&D fan. Like, yeah. I play D&D all the time. Uh, you know, when you've got people like that who are the epitome of awesome and cool and, you know, masculine, if you want to go down And World of Warcraft, so many. Yeah, you've just dawned me that loads of celebrities became gigantic WoW fans in the mid-2000s. I mean, like, Henry Cavill even told the story about that he... Um, yeah. He got the role of Superman while he was doing a raid in WoW. <laughs> and he had to get off that call and go right back into his raid. He's like, oh, I'm going to be Superman. But first I got to, you know, finish this raid. <laughs> Which is an amazing story. I love uh, I love Henry Cavill because he's so obviously passionate about that stuff and, and like, and I mean, he's not he ashamed that, of it. He did that whole post uh, during the pandemic where he built a brand new gaming PC. Yes. And yeah. it was like, and he was so excited. And I remember when Terry Crews, um, yes. saying, you know, his kid was getting really into streaming, you know, watching streamers. And he was like, well, why don't you play? And the kid was like, his kid was like, well, I don't have a, a gaming PC. Terry Crews not only got him all the parts to build his own gaming PC, he bought two of them so that he could do it with his kid. And the way he Amazing. did it was he went on Reddit and he researched it and asked questions. And then he live streamed himself putting it together so that people could help him. He was like, where does this go? And they were like, <laughs> okay, look at the motherboard. There are three lines you want to put in the first one. And he was like, okay, so I do it like this. And they're like, yep. And then he's like, okay, cool. He put in. It was a whole immersive experience, but who fucking cooler than Terry Crews yeah. to watch it's, that yeah. and be like, you know what? Yeah. Gaming is gaming. Building is a PC is coming. badass. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, but it's so true. It 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 has been a big, big kind of change, a big transition. But what I'll kind of say is because we're we're going to start closing this out. Like, yeah, I think yeah, like I think it's interesting when I talk to people like yourself, and there's there's few people that I've spoken to that like I love it because I feel like we came along on a very similar journey. You know, uh, through through kind of like the, the type of experiences we probably had with video games, with horror, with all these types of media and how they've shaped yeah. our lives. And it's great when you can kind of connect with people. And like, what what amazes me, and it's a little bit like talking about stuff like, I don't know, the Troubles here in Ireland that used to be, when I was a kid, it was like, oh, there's the Troubles up the North and they're really bad and everything. Like now I talk to my nephews and they're like, what were those? Like they don't understand. Bec like I feel like it's like that. I think there'd be people, there'd be younger people who might watch a video like this and say, "Holy shit! I can't believe that it was like that. That you could, that you weren't like able to be really into like." But it was. Yeah, and that's and that's what we spoke about earlier was that you know, it's you know how you view gaming depends on the generation you came yeah. from and the the lens that you use to kind of, um, to look at your experiences. Because like we said, you know, the youth now, gaming is cool. It's fun. Yeah. It's something that you can have a career in. It's something yeah. that you can, you know, make a ton of money and be a celebrity. You can be an esports legend. Um, you know, there's, there's so much that you can do in the gaming world now that back in the day, no one ever thought of it. I remember I was telling Ariel there used to there was a um, a uh, a daily comic in the newspapers called The Far Side, 
Oh, and, yes. Uh, from Gary Larson. And yeah. one of them, it showed two parents in a doorway looking at their son who's, you know, on his belly, you know, looking at the TV with a controller and is playing a video game. And the husband has his arm around his wife with a pipe in his mouth and she has her hands clasped as they're looking like adoringly and there are thought bubbles coming from their head and it's of uh job postings in a newspaper which a lot of people will a lot of the youth will never remember that that was a thing <laughs> that there were job postings in the classified section of newspapers <laughs> but it was like um save the princess 40,000 a year with benefits uh defeat uh, the Lizard King, 50000 a year, uh, 401k, like things like that. And the joke was that this was unreal. It was unbelievable yeah. that it would never happen, that this was so and absurd. And then PewDiePie came along. <laughs> and, then it, and then suddenly it became reality. Yeah. And that comic is no longer funny because parents should be able to look at their kids who love video games and say, you can have a career in this. You can oh, make a definitely. life on this. Oh, and that's 100%. what's so And so if we're talking about what are we excited about for the future, what I'm excited about is all of the stories that we are going to see from the people living through the times that we're going through and yes. how they are going to take those stories. Because we see it in movies all the time. Yeah. Horror is such an amazing reflection of society at any given point. Now we're going to see the youth of today take the stories that they're living through and make them into interactive video games. And that is so exciting to think of what's to come. That I cannot think of a better way to finish this up than that statement. That is that is awesome. Um, John, I want to thank you for coming on and chatting with me at no, length. No, no, no. I want to thank you for having me on here. And if you try and thank me, I'll find a way to thank you again, you son of a bitch. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, what I'll say, though, is you are active on the social medias. You are on yes. uh, Twitter. Um, uh, what I'll do is I'll put links in the description anyway that people can check you That's out. That's really the involved. only one that I use these days. I'm, I'm not I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> I have an Instagram account. I pretty much never use it. I deleted my Facebook because, uh, fuck Facebook. And because also you're that smart, yeah. <laughs> a, a million pounds lifted from my shoulders. It was yes. amazing. Uh, but yeah, I'm on Twitter and I'm happy to chat with anyone. And, and John is well worth following because, John, you, yeah, he, he, you have some incredibly like, engaging... You, you can be re have a really funny post one minute about something hilarious. Then you can actually be talking about something that is of great importance and they, like and everything in between. It's the gamut of experiences. It's it's asking for people to, like involvement of what do you think of this or, you know, pointing out yeah. injustice or and it's nice. It's nice to, that you it's, do engage people. Well, I in a weird way, I kind of look at Twitter strangely enough almost like a video game it's supposed to be interactive yeah you're supposed to be able to communicate and chat and and kind of follow stories and learn and grow and just become better at being a person so i think it's an amazing platform and i and i encourage anyone uh to interact with me i'm always happy to to chat absolutely and um guys uh yeah i just this was honestly a pleasure. As I say, it's it's gone on a little bit longer than the usual ones. <laughs> may end up may end up being hacked up into two episodes. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but I I had a blast the whole way throughout. Um, I just look part of the reason that I started making these doing the interviews um, at the start of all this was just because during this time I wanted to do nothing more than nerd out with friends about the things that the, sh the shared loves we have. Um, yeah. And for me, yeah, like, uh, this was just a lot of fun. Um, so, John, uh, like, I'm not going to say thank you because you told me you'd you'd call me out in there. So instead, I'll just say... Um, Listen, before, <laughs> real quick, before you end, I'll say this. I'm not going to thank you, but I just want to say <laughs> it's, it's such a noble thing and such a good thing that you're doing because, like we said, the, the times that we're in are painful and difficult and lonely. And knowing that we're not alone in the things that we love gives us so much to look forward to. So, you know, what you're doing is important. And for that, I appreciate what you are doing. And I know a lot of people out there feel the same way. So, yeah, I, I won't say thank you because you already know that, but I appreciate you. 
for what I, you do. I appreciate you right back. And I appreciate everybody that has checked out the channel and has watched even yes. a minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever a length of time you've checked out. Thank you so much. And what I will say is that- Comment, like, and subscribe. Smash yeah. that like <laughs> button. Oh, great. I didn't even have to say it this video. Yes. yes. <laughs> it hurts. It hurts every time I say it. <laughs> but I will say I'll that take the does, bullet for you. <laughs> it does help a lot. It does. And uh, yeah, like, but it, it also just helps with, yeah, like getting this out there, getting it seen. And as, yep. as, as you just said, John, like for me, this is just about there's a reason that this channel is called Let's Survive and why the tagline became what it is, which is Let's Survive Together, because that's all we're trying to do at the moment. That's all we're all trying to do in our own little way is just get through this thing in the way that makes sense to us. Um, and if that's nerding out about horror video games or if it's playing D&D &D with your friends on Zoom or if it's whatever like just just if it's buying a new pet i don't know whatever just do what you yeah. need to do to get through this thing um and get I wanna, your pet so you can do couch co-op <laughs> me and morty you're gonna be playing some we're gonna be streaming some stuff he's like why did you wake me up you asshole <laughs> <laughs> it is fuck it's almost three in the morning for you <laughs> oh man that's that's normal i i want to also quick, quickly say though um, a massive shout out to, and I will actually also put a link to Ariel's Twitter in down below as well, because people should also check out Ariel, uh, John's wife, who's amazing and wonderful. And uh, likewise is very interesting to follow, I think, because she talks about important things and is just a good person. If you like and following also good people. And a horror fan. Yes, so. a gigantic, again, like... John is somebody that when I'm around the two of them, talk about feeling like the most stupid person in the room. When I'm around both of them, I feel like I feel like I basically only know that it chapter one and two exists. I know nothing else <laughs> about the horror. <laughs> I am, of course, joking in that sense, but at the same time, I do think they're both horror experts, like phenomenal people. Um anyway, we're gonna say good luck and uh yeah. I'm going to close this out by saying what I always say at the end of every episode, which is again the unofficial tagline of the show, which is let's survive together and peace out. Thanks so much, Jan. Thank you.